America as a nation is founded on ideals that are universal uh, and are built one of their largest freaking economy and largest military. However, I, I think that the people, those who have lived under prosperity for a long time, and that's one of the main contradictions, is that they start turning against the ideas that made them mm -hmm. prosperous at the moment. And uh, so, so one of, I would say, the ideals of, of ide ideas beyond borders is making sure that the American ideals spread, that they can continue, kind of like when you send the humans to Mars, so in that way humanity can continue, right. is that send the American ideals all over the world, so in that way these, these ideals will continue. <laughs>
our mutual friend introduced us and she said, you know, you should just have this guy on the show and just talk to him. And I was like, all right, let's see what happens. And and here I met this guy who was roughly new to America, but I was like, he loves freedom. You want to talk about classical liberalism and ideas, which now you've turned into this nonprofit and all of this stuff. So you you just freaking love this country. I mean, it's just it just comes through very clearly with you. Yeah, and, and the thing is like, I love this country even before I came here. Even though my experience with America is, is at le- mixed bag. I mean, my first introduction to America was a Humvee in front of our house uh, with, <laughs> with U.S. soldiers. What, what year was that? That was 2003, when wow. the, when the, because I was born at the first war, like the, uh, so I guess my parents were busy when there was no electricity and I was, they had sex and I was born, yeah. but. <laughs> so the, you were born during the original Gulf the, the War. The first Gulf War. So and that was 92. Nine, nine, end of 90, 1990, and then 91 is when I was born. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the second war is 2003, and I remember that day very vividly, is that we were watching the local television, and there was also Iranian television was intercepting in Iraq, and they were telling us that the U.S. military is be- being defeated in the south, and there are all these soldiers being killed, and the Iraqis are winning, and stuff like that. And then my, my brother was in, in the second floor, and he's like, there are American tanks in front of our house. And then within like half an hour, like the American tanks were bombing my elementary school, which was an, which has a military base of the Iraqi army. And within like a couple days, so that was in early April, um, pretty much all of the highway, which our, our house was in front of the highway where the U.S. military came into Baghdad. And that was my first introduction to the Americans. <laughs> uh, so, so, so what did you think of America then? Um, honestly, it was more like an alien feeling. I'm like, who are these people? And then, then, I mean, thank goodness, I mean, we were, my parents studied in the UK, so, so I was able to speak English, even though I still, my, my English is still, depends on how much margaritas I've had <laughs> during the day. I was, but <laughs> I was gonna get to margaritas later, because the true way that I know you're an American, you love a margarita uh, more than anyone I know. And that was, yeah, thanks to Texas. Which is technically Mexican, but we'll. Well, it's a melting pot. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, that, so the, the first, I would say, the first interaction with American was an American soldier, and uh, they were like very friendly. They were kind of very curious, and they were go oh, here. We are here to like d- uh, d- defeat Saddam Hussein. However, things escalated badly very quickly. So, so the reaction of of the American army to Iraqis became more negative as they started getting more attacked. Uh, however, one of the benefits that came in after the war was the internet, and I was I mean, at 2003, 2004. The internet was not as advanced as it is today, um, and but I was able to like just explore the world through through the internet and see what America is like and what what the values of America were. So like when all of that civil wars was happening, I was sitting at home reading Thomas Jefferson and the, <laughs> and, the and the Age of Reason by Thomas Paine and Common Sense and stuff like that, and I was like these are. And, and the story like of America, at least the beginning story, and even like the Europe 33 years war, et cetera, or the origin of the Enlightenment, is what I think is the Middle East is facing right now. So it's like it's the founding is of America and the, and the civil wars that it had and European civil wars with Protestants and Catholics, stuff like that, is what, we, what I witnessed. So it's just like we're 300 years behind. Right. Um, and my goal is to, is to bring those values into the region that I came from, which I think are the reason why thousands and hundreds of thousands of people are prosperous are the values that founded America, which I think our values were spreading. And you quite literally are doing that with your life. That's what Ideas Beyond Borders does. Exactly, and, and I think is that even with my disappointment, um, I mean, in a theoretical world, let's say if America turns against America, let's say, I think that these values are still worth defending. So I think is that spreading the values of freedom, America is itself an idea as well as a country, and that's, I think, what is very unique about this country is that uh, there is, I mean, not with all my love for my Canadian neighbors, but they don't, there's no Canadian idea. That, mm-hmm. But America as a nation is founded on ideals that are universal uh, and are built one of the largest freaking economy and largest military. However, I, I think that the people, those who have lived under prosperity for a long time, and that's one of the main contradictions, is that they start turning against the ideas that made them mm-hmm. prosperous at the moment. And uh, so, so one of, I would say, the ideals of, of ide- ideas beyond borders is making sure that the American ideals spread that they can continue Kind of like when you send the humans to Mars, so in that way humanity can continue, right. is that send the American ideals all over the world, so in that way 
these these ideals will continue. Uh, does, it, does it blow your mind? I mean, when you go back, you were just in Iraq not yeah. too long ago, and you travel the world, obviously. When you go to the places where it's not okay to say what you think and all of these things, and you're translating books so that people can read these great texts in the countries that aren't as open, uh, and then you compare that to the people here, it, it you know, who are fighting against freedom or, or yeah. you know, not really aware of how good it is, it must drive you nuts. It does. I, I think it's, it's, it's because um, that's again one of the one of the contradictions is that uh, when you live under freedom for a long time, uh, you start becoming cynical. I think one of the main things that I dislike about kind of a specific section of of Americans, not obviously not all. I think, as I said, I think most Americans are apolitical, and to some extent, they don't know what they have, and they don't necessarily. Um, appreciate what they have, but don't necessarily view of the success. Yeah, um, and I think I'm more like those who are cynical. Like I remember, I gave a speech at UC Berkeley, and and there were, and and the, I was talking about like my first experience of a suicide bomber and how literally the ecosystem that allows this thing to happen. And one of the students was like, "Oh, we have the same thing here." I'm like, "Where?" <laughs> I always see is like a shawarma restaurant that's. Fucked up. I mean, the shawarma is like, I don't know, made from rabbit you're meat. You're telling um, me a Berkeley shawarma place isn't the best? No, I, I recommend other places. Yeah. Um, so, so I was like, okay, seriously, like, you, how delusional you must think that yeah. you think that life in America is as bad as it is in other places? Not, not. I mean, some places obviously are developed, like America, Norway. I just was in Norway. It's a pretty cool country. Yeah, uh, but. Just say it's like, also a very small, largely homogenous country. Exactly. And, and, yeah. and when they had start having more immigrants, even in Denmark and other places, they, they get confused, right? Because they are very homogeneous. That's why even like systems like democratic socialism, whatever it's called, um, can operate because it's more like a tribe that became a country. But, but the idea in America is like you have all of these people from different parts of the world, most of them able to coexist and function. I think it's pretty wonderful. Um, and because I come from a con- country and a place, a region in which diversity is actually a curse, not a blessing. Mm-hmm. So, so many people fight for a homogeneous place. The Kurds are fighting for their own place. The Assyrians and the Christians want their own small territory. Uh, the Shias want their thing. And so, in a way, it's like where I come from, diversity is is a curse. And while here. Because the, the identity of the country is built on ideals, um, and unfortunately now there's a whole identitarian identity politics world in which everything is about, is about race and stuff, but I think the founding of America was about ideals, and, and we've seen it functioning for 300 years, and I think it's really worth preserving. I mean, I'm definitely not giving up, and I'm trying my best now 10 years later uh, to be more involved in the local conversation, even though the Middle East is enough headache. I mean, I, I, I've had my fair share of tequila every couple of days, and um, it, <laughs> that's never, it's never enough. But but I think is that I think as a duty of now being a, a citizen and being welcomed by this wonderful country, I think it's also part of my duty to contribute here in any way I can. What, what's going on in Iraq now? I feel like we don't talk about Iraq. Nobody knows what's going on. You know, people look back in hindsight at the war in a very uh, mostly with, negative, with very different glasses than at the time. You actually, in retrospect, you, you're happy that uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think essentially happy that the Americans liberated from Saddam, but that may not be connected to exactly what's going on now. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I support. I wouldn't say in a direct way like that I support the war, but I think is that the options that are available. I mean, I look at the Iraq and and from kind of the lowest of standards, and and mostly because of its history. Iraq started with a king that the British installed after the Ottoman Empire. The king was killed by the communists, and then the socialists killed the communists, and then Saddam Hussein killed the socialists, and then Saddam Hussein was hanged. That's the history of Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, in seven seconds. So well so so this is so when you're trying to like kind of look at the ecosystem of kind of the history, that's the history. So and Saddam Hussein at his like the last years were like after the first Gulf War is his worst and was leading the country into explosion. Um, the alternative, I think, that if the Iraq War never happened or the US didn't intervene, we would end up exactly like Syria, which is in a weird way. Now when I came back to Iraq. Now there are Syrian refugees who live in Iraq. Mm. So imagine how bad Syria is that they come to Iraq for, mm. for refugee status. So, so I went back to Iraq after 13 years, 
Uh, and I mostly went to the Kurdistan region of Iraq, even though I was slightly on the borders of, of federal Iraq and Mosul. And it is really mind-blowing how the country, at least a, a part of the country, has become. Mm -hmm. uh, Iraq significantly has been stable relatively over the past couple of years. Uh, the reasons are kind of somehow sinister, because, but it's also uh, a, a reason, I guess, of application of Milton Friedman theories is that now the political parties of the Sunnis and the Shias and the Kurds have enough investments in the country. So like some of them own shopping malls and, and restaurants and all that stuff. So pretty much all of them now are interested in keeping the country stable. Mm -hmm. So now because they have vested interests, they no longer support suicide bombers and stuff like that. So that's why you don't hear about Iraq on the news. Because there has not, as far as I know, there has not been a suicide attack since 2000, like since the defeat of ISIS. And as a result, the country, of result of that stability, there's now investments and people coming in. And weirdly, but not weirdly, the Kurdistan region asked us, so when I went back to Iraq for, for, for the first time in 13 years, so I met with the government of, of Kurdistan, at least a representative of them, and they were like, we would love you to open an office in, in ideas beyond borders in this place. We are very open to Western ideas. We want, would like... Like, whatever America has, we actually want some of it. We mm -hmm. want to learn about the experiment, like translate more books, work with our universities. Uh, we started like a small kind of venture fund called Innovation Hub uh, that supports startups and, and things like that. So moving towards privatization. So in the, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, I think Iraq is doing much better than I left it, which is itself a low standard. But I think is that it definitely has the potential of becoming uh, really, a, I mean, significantly much better country, even much better than during Saddam Hussein. So in, in, when, I think when people try to, even with, I had a, a, a debate on Slate magazine, which Christopher Hitchens used to write for, for about the Iraq war, but Slate went far left sure, sure. after the death of Hitchens. Like and, pretty much all the websites. And pretty much all the websites. And the thing is that most of the, even the conversation was, I mean, many of the people who oppose the war, uh, and some are right reasons, some are bad reasons. And but, however, most of them they try to connect to domestic affairs. Oh, Bush sucked. We don't trust Bush, and mm -hmm. therefore, oh, we don't trust the Republican Party, and and things like that. So eventually, I mean, many Americans cannot even name four provinces in Iraq. Oh, I, I, I bet <laughs> um, ninety nine percent can't name probably one. So, so, but the, but at the same time, have very strong opinions about yeah. it. So, so it, it's definitely a complicated. Sub Al Anbar Province. How about that? Pretty Th good. That's huh? a good one. I mean, that's the one where America did not have a good time. But, uh, but yeah. With, with that being said, it's like I mean, we, we've seen that also with Afghanistan. Is that, with, and that's I would say is like one of the reasons why I think people like me have to take a lead. I mean, I don't believe in saviors. I think that people from the region have to fix their own region, and which is the reason I started my organization, is the reason why I started support many organizations in Iraq and stuff like that. In fact, my goal of my organization is ceasing to exist. Yeah. Like, we don't, we don't, we don't want to be, we don't want to build this bureaucracy in which you just want to advocate for the cause and you keep raising money just because uh, you, there is an organization you want to maintain. So eventually, I think the people there have to, I think America, with all its mistakes, allowed the room for that to happen. Uh, there's now free press, there's freedom of speech. When I know it's under attack, I'm here. Uh, yeah. That, I think, is like the seed of building a functional society. It's the seed of innovation. It's the seed of progress. Um, and not progress towards hell in the way that progressives in America are, but, mm -hmm. like, but actual progress. And I think that America built that seed. Even in Afghanistan, now we're working with like underground schools. Like We built a network of schools of teachers who educate girls underground from different houses all over the place. And I asked them, I was like, why the hell do you do what you do? Like, what's, what's really the motivation? And they're like, we are the first women to ever been to school in most of our tribe. Hmm. And most of the reason why we went to school is because America came to our country. So in that kind of 20 years, right. some of these women went to school, they went to college, et cetera, and now they feel it's their duty to make sure that the girls of tomorrow don't end, end up being illiterate. So that is a success story of the American intervention. The American withdrawals, however, that's another story. But I think is that I think that we, we, we can always talk about the negatives of the sure. intervention. But I, but I am seeing, like, even when and I would love to take you to Kurdistan and I have yeah, a gift from I'd you for Kurdistan, yeah. is that you will see that people are appreciative. And I think what, what happens with the Kurds is that they took leadership. America did what it can, but then at the same time, they're like, we want our 
country or place to be developed, and they took leadership and they made it happen. So, so, I, so in effect, they have a. It's not. I know it's not technically a country by international standards, but they have a country in essence, right? Like to, to, in, to some extent. I mean, yeah. it's. I mean, it's a semi-autonomous. I mean, not region. according to Turkey and not yeah, according yeah. to Iraq, I guess. Uh, but the but, politics. I mean, I mean yeah. that needs like six bottles of tequila. Yeah. Just, just. Uh, <laughs> but ma- to make it to make it very very uh, s- simple is that. I mean, there are multiple, I know that's not the official narrative, but there are different types of Kurds. Mm -hmm. So that's also part of it. I mean, even the Kurds themselves speak different languages. Generally speaking, the Kurds of Iraq and Iran speak a similar language, have a similar heritage, and the ones in Turkey and Syria have a different heritage, different language. The ones in Turkey in particular who are supported a lot by the Soviet Union. So there's a major group called the PKK, Mm -hmm. which is mostly communist, like, nut jobs, in my opinion and who have extreme differences with the ones in Iraq and, and, and Iran. Um, so there are a lot of kind of issues within unity for, for the Kurds. However, the Kurdistan region of Iraq is kind of the most successful, it's, it's institutionalized. They have their own parliaments. Um, and it's definitely a success story, which I think many other Kurds from the neighboring places can look up to as, as a model that they can follow. And so if you are an Arab Iraqi, you t- technically need a residency when you enter the Kurdistan region of Iraq. So kind of, it's not a visa, but but you need, uh, if you are an Iraqi American, then there's like, you can, even if you're Arab, you can stay all over you want. But so it is technically, I mean, the Kurdistan region of Iraq is technically, a, I mean, you see more flags of Kurdistan there than if you see flags of Iraq. And, and however, there are many Arabs and there are many investors from the Gulf states and others building fancy hotels and, res- and restaurants. And it's, it's so the Kurds there f- found out that it's good to do business with the Arabs and and not be in that constant state of turmoil. So in some ways, it's uh, you sort of hinted that this earlier, or you basically said it. I mean, capitalism, the ability to just trade with each other, sort of is the first nugget to, to getting to everything else. That people suddenly realize, oh, I've got a shop. I've got employees. There's people around me. Like, let, there's something worth protecting. 100%. I'm 100% a believer in in the in the kind of the how connectedness. I mean, even now with Saudi Arabia, I mean, Yes, we can talk about a lot about MBS, but if you look at it from the core, like Saudi Arabia, because of the fact oil, they want to diversify from oil. Before they have oil, they can say whatever they want. Like, it's our oil, you don't like us, go to hell. Mm-hmm. Now they, are, they want to open up for investments. To open up for investments, you need to liberalize. And you need to be open to, to capitalism and the fact that when you're gonna bring in people from Florida and LA and everywhere, they would like to have a, to bring their girlfriend or their wife, or they like to bring their the husband. So, so as a result, they have to. Mm-hmm. So, like in a way, the economic freedom or the incentive to create investments is opening up Saudi Arabia, which which is the most conservative place in in the in the region. So, I think is that um, I'm I'm that's why I'm wearing this uh, dollar. <laughs> Even though it's actually I the pencil. That's the uh-huh. uh, which is which talks about how like the pencil itself is made from different elements and it needed the work of multiple people from different countries to work together to make the pencil. And, and that's, I think, is, is a central piece if we want to move the region. And that's a great thing about investments in capitalism. It, re- it reduces dependency. Most of these regions and because of these shitty international development organizations like the UN and all of that, mm-hmm. what they do is that they create dependency. Mm-hmm. They, they give, oh, here's the Yazidis, here's some food, here's some stuff. But then they, they create a system in which you have to constantly give money to the UN for people not to starve. It's just incredible because it's what we have with all of our welfare state and then we've exported it into these giant globalist organizations. With, with in some cases, bad ideas. I mean, I, I think the, the study yeah, in, in Iraq about they built a school for like people who identify as girls or something like that, and people <laughs> in, in Iraq, have, yeah. <laughs> and people have no idea how to translate that in the first place. Oh my God. So there is also a backlash now, a significant backlash, I would say, against some of the ideologies that come with these international development organizations. That they they kind of give you the give you a, a bag of food, but it also comes with the whole baggage of. But you have to dress your son up like a woman. Yes, that, that, I mean that will go far away in, in Bar Province. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there is definitely a backlash, and, and we try to, I mean, as an organization that's new, and we try to work, we have our ideals, but we try to work within the region itself. Um, and e- even now, I mean, the conversation is very difficult, like, to tell people to westernize. But even if you tell them to westernize, what, what version of the West they should westernize to? Mm-hmm. 
So, so the thing is that the main thing is, is to get people into these ideals and let them make up. Uh, and I don't think like the ultimate goal of, of freedom when people get to know about classical liberalism, they end up subscribing to the walk totalitarian ideology. I think is that they become self-evident and they were like, we want to keep that. So that's actually a great segue to where I wanted to go next, which is that when I first met you, there was a, there was a really huge uh, sort of secular humanist movement in America. Oh, the good old days. You and I went to the Reason Rally in D.C. together, and I spoke at the National Mall, and this is at the sort of height of Sam Harris, and, and you mentioned uh, Hitchens before, and Dawkins, and there was this feeling of like you could, you could escape all of the old of religion and create this sort of perfect secular thing. Uh, except it's pretty much fallen apart, and I and I suspect that most of your support these days is somewhat connected to people of faith more than purely secular organizations. Is that is that fair to say? Um, both. I mean, I, I would say where most of our support comes from the classical liberal world. Um, that would be like Atlas Network and kind of the and, and people who support like the libertarian classical liberal space. I would say very little of our support comes from that humanist world. In fact, that secular humanist world generally turned against us, is that right. they were like, oh, you're trying to spread the ideas of capitalism that led to slavery and <laughs> shit like that. Right, uh, so the people that you thought were your great, that, that's what I was trying yeah, to get yeah, yeah. the people that you thought were your greatest allies probably when you got here, and me as a liberal back then, yeah, yeah, yeah. they turned. They up. were the ones that ended up turning on us the most, and they were supporting, in fact, the groups that were going against us. So, so because of cultural relativism, that's that was one of the, I would say, the central tenets of uh, of these groups that were associated with, is that they were they hated the values that made this country prosperous. So, in a way, is that they most of the of their criticism is of America than than other cultures. So, in the moment you say, "Oh, there is issues happening in the Muslim world or in the Middle East and things like that," they always try to drive it back. But do you know America is racist? <laughs> and do you know that that like you were you, usually thinking about that in uh, in Iraq in yeah, yeah. ninety seven? Where were you? Come on. <laughs> um, exactly. It's like it's like when I was yeah when I was in ninety seven. I was like, "Oh shit, uh, maybe I should stay in Iraq. Why would I get moved to New York?" Right. Uh, and and so, so that is generally the the these kind of groups. I think that the I mean there are secular groups even within like the Ayn Rand crowd and the objectivists that were not on reason rally. So like the the secular world is kind of divided. It's between those who mostly on the left, unfortunately, uh, and there are those who like kind of the objectivist and. Um, and they're at a clash, and that's why you don't see them being invited to these largely kind of humanist uh, places. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that it's generally terrible for, because I see a separation between the importance of separating religion from the state, which is, because I've been in the victim when that didn't happen, mm -hmm. in which the Sunnis of their own version want to make it the case, and the Shias want to make the case, etc. I think that the, kind of these these values can be separated from concepts like the welfare state, and, and in America, unfortunately, sometimes many of these things comes as a as a package. It's yeah. like you, in order for you to believe in capitalism, you also so, some cases you have to have a stance on abortion and have a stance on guns. Right, right, right. And have, these things are all deeply they're all connected. connected because yeah. you know, like the, ki the 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 embryos have guns, and yeah. then <laughs> so so like everything has to be connected. I, I see that like, even, even within the founding fathers of the United States when, like part of the reason why America was established as a secular nation was they were afraid of different factions of Christianity would actually take over and then then there would be, no, the, the Jews are not allowed and the Irish Catholics are not allowed and so, so these concepts unfortunately like they were champions for the wrong reasons by a lot of people within kind of the there's a socialist and stuff like that who who wanted to in order for them to sell the package they were like okay you have to be a socialist and and join and join us right um and then when i was telling them within this crowd that i actually think that socialism is bullshit then they, they were like saying me that no you're not a true humanist and right. you're not you're a sellout basically you're, a sellout. you're not brown anymore and yeah yeah i became uh, betty white yeah um <laughs> so, so, the, so the thing is that the, they wanted very like I think they have utilized secularism in a way and, and like the, uh, these ideas to sell their own bad ideas mm -hmm. um, because I believe that there, there can be a separation and I think that th even the values that I advocate for whether in Iraq or America 
is mostly coexistence. I mean, the thing is that I'm interested, so capitalism, we know for centuries has been a very driving force of getting people to work together. When you connect countries, that leads to more coexistence. When you remove the, the, the one version of religion to kind of dictate how other people live, that leads to coexistence. So I'm, I am, well, the socialists don't want coexistence. They want, socialists want dominance. Um, so I think that, unfortunately, many of these things get mixed up, uh, in, in America in particular. Like you can go to places like Norway or Sweden where these things are a bit separated, like there's, there's kind of a history of secularism outside the socialist forces, and they don't, like you can meet a, a liberal party in Sweden, right. and they are very confident being secular, but also support free markets. There's no, they don't see any contradiction in this, but, but here- well, Even in England, you, if you say you're a liberal, it has a different connotation exactly. than saying, and you're in, that's why I can't say it in America anymore with, with a degree of like- Of confidence. I to, well, I just have to then explain it for an hour every time. Yeah, because, they, I mean, um, they hijack these terms, um, and I think, now it's becoming so clear, we can, we can see these divisions between kind of the older Democrats and kind of the younger generation Democrats, in which those, those like from the older side who kind of followed what they thought was liberal, look at these guys and they're like, you guys are crazy. Mm -hmm. but, so, there's, so there's divisions here as well in, in, in terms of kind of liberalism. But I think, um, I mean, to kind of, if I see the segue of, of your question, if you, uh, is that, that the, kind of the secular atheist world led us to what we have right now. And I know Peter Bogosian is now having questions about that because he was, unlike okay. me, who was like, he was an advocate for atheism as like front and center. He wrote a book called The Manual for Creating <laughs> Atheists. And now most of his friends are, are uh, uh, usually, well, certainly people of faith, but mostly evangelical Christians, I think. Yeah, so, so he is kind of, he qu start questioning uh, whether that would be the, the kind of the outcome of what they forget for. I think... There is some truth to that. I think is that we just we, we aim to destroy religion, but we had no alternative idea. Mm -hmm. We just know what we hated, but we know what we stand what we stood for. And and if you looked at even Reason Rally and many of these places, I mean now we look at it in hindsight, there were places of kind of hate and, and resentment. They were like, We hate the Christian <laughs> right, we hate this, we hate that. <laughs> but if you ask them about like what did they actually stood for, it was very blurry. Uh, well I think is that but if you think about it now, many of us who were there, you, Michael Shermer, me, Melissa, Peter Bogosian, and all that stuff, who used to be kind of critical of, of the religious right, all of us moved to become critical of, of, of the woke left. And I think is that it's not a surprise that is the case because we actually understood what liberalism is and what we, what we stood for. And I think is that it's, it should be more people should be more outspoken than what we have right now. Let's finish with this. As a proud new American and you love your American jackets and your American <laughs> shirts and your American hats and all of those things. When you see the type of political fighting we have now, which we don't have the sectarian sort of house to house, we're going to kill you fighting. We certainly don't have that yet. But we've had our riots. We have our cities burning down at times, all, all of that stuff, which always feels to me like it could just be turned on at any given moment. You know, there could just be some incident any day today that turns it on tomorrow. How worried are you that where the way we deal with politics or the cultural issues could lead us to basically being this sort of sectarian, you know, we're a huge country, but, but basically being this very odd sectarian cannibalized blob? Um, I'm worried and not at the same time. I mean, I, not to quote Bill Clinton, but, but I mean, he said, like, I think if I'm quoting him is that the, the, the worst of America can be solved by the best of America. So I'm, I, over, I mean, now I've been to 42 states, as, as far, and I've talked to many people from different people from the political aisle. When I became a U.S. citizen, there were people who support Trump that congratulate me. There are people who support uh, Hillary that support the Democratic Party. So I think is that, I mean, America is a wonderful country. I think most people, cognitively or not cognitively, understand that and believe that. I mean, mm -hmm. many people when they're like, oh, "I'm moving this country to move to Canada," they're like, "Are you fucking kidding me? You're not moving to Canada." <laughs> Nobody knows. Like, you, you live in Jersey City and you enjoy your life there. Like, yeah. don't tell me you're moving to to Canada. So, so I think many people, when you take it, when they are pressured, I think they understood that this country is great. 
However, there is kind of a sense of virtual signaling of cynicism and stuff like that to show to kind of give a sense. I think that's what the woke kind of give to some extent. They give a sense of moral superiority. So everybody wants to have that feeling, instead of like wearing a big cross walking in the streets of Beirut during the civil war. It's yeah. like <laughs> it gives you like a sense of. So I, I think that so that's my kind of optimistic side. My least my kind of worried side is that we have seen this before. Is that I mean I would say. At least within the political arena, we have reached a level, I mean, even in counterterrorism circles, it's called the level of dehumanization. Mm-hmm. So it's like you look at the other side as kind of the enemy and that deserve to be destroyed. Um, that itself is like a seed of the m- worse things can, can yeah, happen as a result of that. You can do almost uh, anything. Because that's happen. like, I mean, what we see in the Middle East and even Balkan places, stuff like that, that is like when people reach the humanization level and then the rule of law gets destroyed and then people start killing each other. So I think is that America, at least in the political arena, what is observed, and the thing is that, and in America everything can become like an industry of sorts. So like there is an industry of polarization that that wants people to uh, destroy each other and then claim that they are the savior. I'm saving you from the other side. I mean, when I grew up in Iraq, there's, I mean, when people understand, like, how did Al Qaeda and ISIS spread in these places, right? ISIS took over the one third of Iraq in like a couple of weeks, and the message of ISIS at the time, how they recruited people, was not that oh we're here to destroy the, the Christian West. It was I am here to defend you from the other side. Mm-hmm. And then so all of these kind of extremists rise in the ecosystem that allows them to be, be viewed as the saviors. And I think America is not there yet, but I think there are definitely seeds uh, to, 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 for that to happen. And I'm, you're doing your best, and I will do my best to make sure that this doesn't happen, whether it's through marginalization ideas, but what is it me individually? Or through margaritas. Uh, with margaritas. <laughs> Good to see you, my friend. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about international issues, check out our international playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.